The Autobiography of Charles Darwin, edited by his son Francis Darwin. Section 4. From my return to England, October 2nd, 1836, to my marriage, January 29, 1839. From my marriage, January 29, 1839, and residence in Upper Gower Street, to our leaving London and settling at Down, September 14, 1842. These two years and three months were the most active ones which I ever spent, though I was occasionally unwell, and so lost some time. After going backwards and forwards several times between Shrewsbury, Mare, Cambridge, and London, I settled in lodgings at Cambridge, in Fitzwilliam Street, on December 13th, where all my collections were under the care of Henslow. I stayed there three months and got my minerals and rocks examined by the aid of Professor Miller. I began preparing my journal of travels, which was not hard work, as my manuscript journal had been written with care, and my chief labor was making an abstract of my more interesting scientific results. I sent also, at the request of Lyell, a short account of my observations on the elevation of the coast of Chile to the Geological Society. In Geological Society Proceedings 2, 1838, pages 446 through 449. On March 7, 1837, I took lodgings in Great Marlborough Street in London, and remained there for nearly two years, until I was married. During these two years I finished my journal, read several publications before the Geological Society, began preparing the manuscript for my geological observations, and arranged for the publication of the Zoology of the Voyage of the Beagle. In July I opened my first notebook for facts in relation to the origin of species about which I had long reflected, and never ceased working for the next twenty years. During these two years I also went a little into society, and acted as one of the honorary secretaries of the Geological Society. I saw a great deal of Lyell. One of his chief characteristics was his sympathy with the work of others, and I was as much astonished as delighted at the interest which he showed when, on my return to England, I explained to him my views on coral reefs. This encouraged me greatly, and his advice and example had much influence on me. During this time I saw also a good deal of Robert Brown. I used often to call and sit with him during his breakfast on Sunday mornings, and he poured forth a rich treasure of curious observations and acute remarks but they almost always related to minute points, and he never with me discussed large or general questions in science. During these two years, I took several short excursions as a relaxation, and one longer one to the parallel roads of Glenroy, an account of which was published in the Philosophical Transactions, 1839, pages 39 through 82. This paper was a great failure, and I am ashamed of it, having been deeply impressed with what I had seen of the elevation of the land of South America. I attributed the parallel lines to the action of the sea, but I had to give up this view when Agassiz propounded his glacier-like theory, because no other explanation was possible under our then state of knowledge. I argued in favor of sea action and my error has been a good lesson to me never to trust in science to the principle of exclusion. As I was not able to work all day at science, I read a good deal during these two years on various subjects, including some metaphysical books, but I was not well fitted for such studies. About this time I took much delight in Wordsworth's and Coleridge's poetry and can boast that I read The Excursion twice through. Formerly Milton's Paradise Lost had been my chief favorite, and in my excursions during the voyage of the Beagle, when I 
could take only a single volume, I always chose Milton. From my marriage, 1839, and residence in Upper Gower Street, to our leaving London, 1842. Editor's Note After speaking of his happy married life and of his children, he continues, Francis Darwin. During the three years and eight months while we rested in London, I did less scientific work, though I worked as hard as I possibly could, than during any other equal length of time in my life. This was owing to frequently recurring unwellness, and to one long and serious illness. The greater part of my time, when I could do anything, was devoted to my work on coral reefs, which I had begun before my marriage and of which the last proof sheet was corrected on May 6, 1842. This book, though a small one, cost me twenty months of hard work, as I had to read every work on the islands of the Pacific and to consult many charts. It was thought highly of by scientific men, and the theory therein given is, I think, now well established. No other work of mine was begun in so deductive a spirit as this, for the whole theory was thought out on the west coast of South America, before I had seen a true coral reef. I had therefore only to verify and extend my views by a careful examination of living reefs, but it should be observed that I had during the two previous years been incessantly attending to the effects on the shores of South America of the intermittent elevation of the land, together with denudation and the deposition of sediment. This necessarily led me to reflect much on the effects of subsidence, and it was easy to replace in imagination the continued deposition of sediment by the upward growth of corals. To do this was to form my theory of the formation of barrier reefs and atolls. Beside my work on coral reefs, during my residence in London, I read before the Geological Society papers on the erratic boulders of South America. Geological Society, Proceedings 3, 1842. On Earthquakes, in Geology Transactions, Volume 1840, and on the formation by the agency of earthworms of mold. Geological Society Proceedings 2, 1838. I also continued to superintend the publication of the Zoology of the Voyage of the Beagle, nor did I ever intermit collecting facts bearing on the origin of species, and I could sometimes do this when I could do nothing else from illness. In the summer of 1842 I was stronger than I had been for some time, and took a little tour by myself in North Wales, for the sake of observing the effects of the old glaciers, which formerly filled all the larger valleys. I published a short account of what I saw in the Philosophical Magazine, Philosophical Magazine, 1842. This excursion interested me greatly, and it was the last time I was ever strong enough to climb mountains, or to take long walks such as are necessary for geological work. During the early part of our life in London, I was strong enough to go into general society, and saw a good deal of several scientific men, and other more or less distinguished men. I will give my impressions with respect to some of them, though I have little to say worth saying. I saw more of Lyell than of any other man, both before and after my marriage. His mind was characterized, as it appeared to me, by clearness, caution, sound judgment, and a good deal of originality. When I made any remark to him on geology, he never rested until he saw the whole case clearly, and often made me see it more clearly than I had done before he would advance all possible objections to my suggestion, and even after these were exhausted would long remain dubious. A second characteristic was his hearty sympathy with the work of other scientific men. The slight repetition here, observable, is accounted for 
by the notes on Lyell, etc., having been added April 1881, a few years after the rest of the recollections were written. On my return from the voyage of the Beagle, I explained to him my views on coral reefs, which differed from his, and I was greatly surprised and encouraged by the vivid interest which he showed. His delight in science was ardent, and he felt the keenest interest in the future progress of mankind. He was very kind-hearted and thoroughly liberal in his religious beliefs, or rather disbeliefs, but he was a strong theist. His candor was highly remarkable. He exhibited this by becoming a convert to the descent theory, though he had gained much fame by opposing Lamarck's views, and this after he had grown old. He reminded me that I had many years before said to him, when discussing the opposition of the old school of geologists to his new views, what a good thing it would be if every scientific man was to die when sixty years old, as afterwards he would be sure to oppose all new doctrines. But he hoped that now he might be allowed to live. The science of geology is enormously indebted to Lyell, more so, as I believe, than to any other man who ever lived. When I was starting on the voyage of the Beagle, the sagacious Henslow, who, like all other geologists, believed at that time in successive cataclysms, advised me to get and study the first volume of the Principles, which had then just been published, but on no account to accept the views therein advocated. How differently would anyone now speak of the Principles? I am proud to remember that the first place, namely St. Iago, in the Cape de Verde archipelago, in which I geologized, convinced me of the infinite superiority of Lyell's views over those advocated in any other work known to me. The powerful effects of Lyell's works could formerly be plainly seen in the different progress of the science in France and England. The present total oblivion of Elie de Beaumont's wild hypotheses, such as his craters of elevation and lines of elevation, which latter hypothesis I heard Sedgwick at the Geological Society lauding to the skies, may be largely attributed to Lyell. I saw a good deal of Robert Brown, Fossil Princeps Botanicorum, as he was called by Humboldt. He seemed to me to be chiefly remarkable for the minuteness of his observations and their perfect accuracy. His knowledge was extraordinarily great, and much died with him, owing to his excessive fear of ever making a mistake. He poured out his knowledge to me in the most unreserved manner, yet was strangely jealous on some points. I called him two or three times before the voyage of the Beagle, and on one occasion he asked me to look through a microscope and describe what I saw. This I did, and believe now, that it was the marvelous currents of protoplasm in some vegetable cell. I then asked him what I had seen, but he answered me, That is my little secret. He was capable of the most generous actions. When old, much out of health, and quite unfit for any exertion, he daily visited, as Hooker told me, an old man servant, who lived at a distance, and whom he supported, and read aloud to him. This is enough to make up for any degree of scientific penuriousness or jealousy. I may here mention a few other eminent men whom I have occasionally seen, but I have little to say about them worth saying. I felt a high reverence for Sir J. Herschel, and was delighted to dine with him at his charming house in the Cape of Good Hope, and afterwards at his London house. I saw him also on a few other occasions. He never talked much, but every word which he uttered was worth listening to. I once met at breakfast at Sir R. Murchison's house in the illustrious Humboldt, who honored me by expressing a wish to see me. I was a little disappointed with the great man, 
but my anticipations probably were too high. I can remember nothing distinctly about our interview, except that Humboldt was very cheerful and talked much. Reminds me of Buckle, whom I once met at Hensley Wedgwood's. I was very glad to learn from him his system of collecting facts. He told me that he bought all the books which he read, and made a full index to each of the facts which he thought might provide serviceable to him, and that he could always remember in what book he had read anything, for his memory was wonderful. I asked him how, at first, he could judge what facts would be serviceable, and he answered that he did not know, but that a sort of instinct guided him. From this habit of making indices, he was enabled to give the astonishing number of references on all sorts of subjects, which may be found in his History of Civilization. This book I thought most interesting, and read it twice, but I doubt whether his generalizations are worth anything. Buckle was a great talker, and I listened to him saying hardly a word, nor indeed could I have done so, for he left no gaps. When Mrs. Ferrer began to sing, I jumped up and said that I must listen to her. After I had moved away, he turned around to a friend and said, as was overheard by my brother, Well, Mr. Darwin's books are much better than his conversation. Of other great literary men, I once met Sidney Smith at Dean Millman's house. There was something inexplicably amusing in every word which he uttered. Perhaps this was partly due to the expectation of being amused. He was talking about Lady Cork, who was then extremely old. This was the lady who, as he said, was once so much affected by one of his charity sermons that she borrowed a guinea from a friend to put in the plate. He now said, It is generally believed that my dear old friend Lady Cork had been overlooked. And he said this in such a manner that no one could for a moment doubt that he meant that his dear old friend had been overlooked by the devil. How he managed to express this I know not. I likewise once met Macaulay at Lord Stanhope's, the historian's house. And as there was only one other man at dinner, I had a grand opportunity of hearing him converse, and he was very agreeable. He did not talk at all too much, nor indeed could such a man talk too much, as long as he allowed others to turn the stream of his conversation, and this he did allow. Lord Stanhope once gave me a curious little proof of the accuracy and fullness of Macaulay's memory. Many historians used often to meet at Lord Stanhope's house, and in discussing various subjects, they would sometimes differ from Macaulay, and formerly they often referred to some book to see who is right. But latterly, as Lord Stanhope noticed, no historian ever took this trouble, and whatever Macaulay said was final. On another occasion, I met at Lord Stanhope's house one of his parties of historians and other literary men, and amongst them were Motley and Grote. After luncheon, I walked about Chevening Park for nearly an hour with Grote, and was much interested by his conversation, and pleased by the simplicity and absence of all pretension in his manners. Long ago I dined occasionally with the old Earl, the father of the historian. He was a strange man but what little I knew of him I liked much. He was frank, genial, and pleasant. He had strongly marked features with a brown complexion, and his clothes, when I saw him, were all brown. He seemed to believe in everything which was to others utterly incredible. He said one day to me, Why don't you give up your fiddle-faddle of geology and zoology and turn to the occult sciences? The historian, then Lord Mahon, seemed shocked at such a speech to me, and his charming wife much amused. The last man whom I will mention is Carlyle, seen by me several times at my brother's house, 
and two or three times at my own house. His talk was very racy and interesting, just like his writings, but he sometimes went on too long on the same subject. I remember a funny dinner at my brother's, where, among a few others, were Babbage and Lyell, both of whom liked to talk. Carlyle, however, silenced everyone by haranguing during the whole dinner on the advantages of silence. After dinner, Babbage, in his grimmest manner, thanked Carlyle for his very interesting lecture on silence. Carlyle sneered at almost everyone. One day in my house, he called Grote's history a fetid quagmire with nothing spiritual about it. I always thought, until his reminiscences appeared, that his sneers were partly jokes, but this now seems rather doubtful. His expression was that of a depressed, almost despondent, yet benevolent man, and it is notorious how heartily he laughed. I believe that his benevolence was real, though stained by not a little jealousy. No one can doubt about his extraordinary power of drawing pictures of things and men, far more vivid, as it appears to me, than any drawn by Macaulay. Whether his pictures of men were true ones is another question. He has been all-powerful in impressing some grand moral truths on the minds of men. On the other hand, his views about slavery were revolting. In his eyes, might was right. His mind seemed to me a very narrow one, even if all branches of science, which he despised, are excluded. It is astonishing to me that Kingsley should have spoken of him as a man well fitted to advance science. He laughed to scorn the idea that a mathematician, such as we well, could judge, as I maintained he could, of Goethe's views on light. He thought it a most ridiculous thing that anyone should care whether a glacier moved a little quicker or a little slower or moved at all. As far as I could judge, I never met a man with a mind so ill-adapted for scientific research. While living in London, I attended as regularly as I could the meetings of several scientific societies and acted as secretary to the Geological Society. But such attendance and ordinary society suited my health so badly that we resolved to live in the country, which we both preferred and have never repented of. End of Section 4 Section 5 Residence at Down from September 14, 1842 to the present time, 1876 after several fruitless searches in Surrey and elsewhere, we found this house and purchased it. I was pleased with the diversified appearance of vegetation proper to a chalk district, and so unlike what I had been accustomed to in the Midland countries, and still more pleased with the extreme quietness and rusticity of the place. It is not, however, quite so retired a place as a writer in a German periodical makes it, who says that my house can be approached only by a mule track. Our fixing ourselves here has answered admirably in one way, which we did not anticipate, namely, by being very convenient for frequent visits from our children. Few persons can have lived a more retired life than we have done. Besides short visits to the houses of relations, and occasionally to the seaside or elsewhere, we have gone nowhere. During the first part of our residence, we went a little into society, and received a few friends here, but my health almost always suffered from the excitement, violent shivering and vomiting attacks being thus brought on. I have therefore been compelled for many years to give up all dinner parties, and this has been somewhat of a deprivation to me, as such parties always put me into high spirits. From the same cause, I have been able to invite here very few scientific acquaintances. My chief enjoyment and sole employment throughout life has been scientific work, and the excitement from such work makes me for the time forget, 
or drives quite away my daily discomfort. I have therefore nothing to record during the rest of my life, except the publication of my several books. Perhaps a few details, how they arose, may be worth giving. End of Residence at Down My several publications. In the early part of 1844, my observations on the volcanic islands visited during the voyage of the Beagle were published. In 1845, I took much pains in correcting a new edition of my Journal of Researches, which was originally published in 1839 as part of Fitzroy's work. The success of this, my first literary child, always tickles my vanity more than that of any of my other books. Even to this day, it sells steadily in England and the United States, and has been translated for the second time into German, and into French and other languages. This success of a book of travels, especially of a scientific one, so many years after its first publication, is surprising. Ten thousand copies have been sold in England of the second edition. In 1846, my geological observations on South America were published. I record in a little diary, which I have always kept, that my three geological books, coral reefs included, consumed four and a half years' steady work, and now it is ten years since my return to England. How much time have I lost by illness? I have nothing to say about these three books, except that, to my surprise, new editions have lately been called for. Geological Observations, 2nd edition, 1876. Coral Reefs, 2nd edition, 1874. In October, 1846, I began to work on Cirripedia. When on the coast of Chile, I found a most curious form, which burrowed into the shells of Concholipas, and which differed so much from all other Cirripedes that I had to form a new suborder for its sole reception. Lately an allied burrowing genus has been found on the shores of Portugal. To understand the structure of my new Cirripede, I had to examine and dissect many of the common forms, and this gradually led me on to take up the whole group. I worked steadily on this subject for the next eight years, and ultimately published two thick volumes published by the Ray Society, describing all the known living species, and two thin quartos on the extinct species. I do not doubt that Sir E. Lytton Bulwer had me in his mind when he introduced in one of his novels a Professor Long, who had written two huge volumes on limpets. Although I was employed during eight years on this work, yet I record in my diary that about two years out of this time was lost by illness. On this account, I went in 1848 for some months to Malvern for hydropathic treatment, which did me much good, so that on my return home I was able to resume work. So much was I out of health that when my dear father died on November 13, 1848, I was unable to attend his funeral or act as one of his executors. My work on the Cirripedia possesses, I think, considerable value, as besides describing several new and remarkable forms, I made out the homologies of the various parts. I discovered the cementing apparatus, though I blundered dreadfully about the cement glands, and lastly I proved the existence in certain genera of minute males complemental to and parasitic on the hermaphrodites. This latter discovery has at last been fully confirmed, though at one time a German writer was pleased to attribute the whole account to my fertile imagination. The Cirripedes form a highly varying and difficult group of species to class, and my work was of considerable use to me. When I had to discuss the origin of species, the principles of a natural classification. Nevertheless, I doubt whether the work was worth the consumption of so much time.
from September 1854, I devoted my whole time to arranging my huge pile of notes, to observing, and to experimenting in relation to the transmutation of species. During the voyage of the Beagle, I had been deeply impressed by discovering in the Pampean formation great fossil animals covered with armor like that on the existing armadillos. Secondly, by the manner in which closely allied animals replace one another in proceeding southwards over the continent, and thirdly, by the South American character of most of the productions of the Galapagos archipelago, and more especially by the manner in which they differ slightly on each island of the group, none of the islands appearing to be very ancient in a geological sense. It was evident that such facts as these, as well as many others, could only be explained on the supposition that species gradually become modified, and the subject haunted me. But it was equally evident that neither the action of the surrounding conditions, nor the will of the organisms, especially in the case of plants, could account for the innumerable cases in which organisms of every kind are beautifully adapted to their habits of life. For instance, a woodpecker or a tree frog to climb trees, or a seed for dispersal by hooks or plumes. I had always been much struck by such adaptations, and until these could be explained, it seemed to me almost useless to endeavor to prove by indirect evidence that species have been modified. After my return to England, it appeared to me that by following the example of Lyell in geology, and by collecting all facts which bore in any way on the variation of animals and plants under domestication and nature, some light might be perhaps thrown on the whole subject. My first notebook was opened in July 1837. I worked on true Baconian principles and without any theory, collected facts on a wholesale scale, more especially with respect to domesticated productions, by printed inquiries, by conversation with skillful breeders and gardeners, and by extensive reading. When I see the list of books of all kinds which I read and abstracted, including whole series of journals and transactions, I am surprised at my industry. I soon perceived that selection was a keystone of man's success in making useful races of animals and plants. But how selection could be applied to organisms living in a state of nature remained for some time a mystery to me. In October 1838, that is, fifteen months after I had begun my systematic inquiry, I happened to read for amusement Malthus on Population, and being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence, which everywhere goes on from long-continued observation of the habits of animals and plants, it at once struck me that under these circumstances favorable variations would tend to be preserved, and unfavorable ones to be destroyed. The result of this would be the formation of new species. Here, then, I had at last got a theory by which to work. But I was so anxious to avoid prejudice that I determined not for some time to write even the briefest sketch of it. In June 1842, I first allowed myself the satisfaction of writing a very brief abstract of my theory in pencil in thirty-five pages, and this was enlarged during the summer of 1844 into one of two hundred and thirty pages which I had fairly copied out and still possessed. But at that time I overlooked one problem of great importance, and it is astonishing to me, except on the principle of Columbus and his egg, how I could have overlooked it and its solution. The problem is the tendency in organic beings, descended from the same stock, to diverge in character as they become modified. That they have diverged greatly is obvious from the manner in which species of all kinds can be classed under genera, genera under families, families under suborders, and so forth. 
and I can remember the very spot in the road, while in my carriage, when to my joy the solution occurred to me, and this was long after I had come to down. The solution, as I believe, is that the modified offspring of all dominant and increasing forms tend to become adapted to many and highly diversified places in the economy of nature. Early in 1856, Lyell advised me to write out my views pretty fully, and I began at once to do so on a scale three or four times as extensive as that which was afterwards followed in my Origin of Species. Yet it was only an abstract of the materials which I had collected, and I got through about half the work on this scale. But my plans were overthrown, for early in the summer of 1858, Mr. Wallace, who was then in the Malay archipelago, sent me an essay on the tendency of varieties to depart indefinitely from the original type. And this essay contained exactly the same theory as mine. Mr. Wallace expressed the wish that if I thought well of his essay, I should send it to Lyell for perusal. The circumstances under which I consented at the request of Lyell and Hooker to allow an abstract from my manuscript, together with the letter to an Asa Gray, dated September 5, 1857, to be published at the same time with Wallace's essay, are given in the journal of the Proceedings of the Linnaean Society, 1858, page 45. I was at first very unwilling to consent, as I thought Mr. Wallace might consider my doing so unjustifiable, for I did not then know how generous and noble was his disposition. The extract from my manuscript and the letter to Asa Gray had neither been intended for publication and were badly written. Mr. Wallace's essay, on the other hand, was admirably expressed and quite clear. Nevertheless, our joint productions excited very little attention, and the only published notice of them, which I can remember, was by Professor Houghton of Dublin, whose verdict was that at all that was new in them was false, and what was true was old. This shows how necessary it is that any new view should be explained at considerable length in order to arouse public attention. In September 1858, I set to work by the strong advice of Lyell and Hooker to prepare a volume on the transmutation of species, but was often interrupted by ill health and short visits to Dr. Lane's delightful hydropathic establishment at Moor Park. I abstracted the manuscript begun on a much larger scale in 1856, and completed the volume on the same reduced scale. It cost me thirteen months and ten days hard labor. It was published under the title of The Origin of Species in November 1859. Though considerably added to and corrected in the later editions, it has remained substantially the same book. It is no doubt the chief work of my life. It was from the first highly successful. The first small edition of 1,250 copies was sold on the day of publication, and a second edition of 3,000 copies soon afterwards. 16,000 copies have now, 1876, been sold in England, and considering how stiff a book it is, this is a large scale. It has been translated into almost every European tongue, and even into languages as Spanish, Bohemian, Polish, and Russian. It has also, according to Miss Bird, been translated into Japanese. Editor's Note Miss Bird is mistaken, for I learned from Professor Mitsukuri, Francis Darwin. And there it is much studied. Even an essay in Hebrew has appeared on it, showing that the theory is contained in the Old Testament, the reviews were very numerous. For some time I collected all that appeared on the origin and on my related books, and these amount, excluding newspaper reviews, to 265. But after a time I gave up the attempt in despair, 
many separate essays and books on the subject have appeared, and in Germany a catalogue or bibliography on Darwinismus has appeared every year or two. The success of The Origin may, I think, be attributed in large part to my having long before written two condensed sketches, and to my having finally abstracted a much larger manuscript, which was itself an abstract. By this means I was enabled to select the more striking facts and conclusions. I had, also, during many years followed a golden rule, namely, that whenever a published fact, a new observation or thought came across me, which was opposed to my general results, to make a memorandum of it, without fail, and at once, for I had found by experience that such facts and thoughts were far more apt to escape from the memory than favorable ones. Owing to this habit, very few objections were raised against my views, which I had not at least noticed and attempted to answer. It has sometimes been said that the success of the origin proved that the subject was in the air, or that men's minds were prepared for it. I do not think that this is strictly true, for I occasionally sounded not a few naturalists, and never happened to come across a single one who seemed to doubt about the permanence of species. Even Lyell and Hooker, though they would listen with interest to me, never seemed to agree. I tried once or twice to explain to able men what I meant by natural selection, but signally failed. What I believe was strictly true is that innumerable well-observed facts were stored in the minds of naturalists, ready to take their proper places, as soon as any theory which would receive them was sufficiently explained. Another element in the success of the book was its moderate size, and this I owe to the appearance of Mr. Wallace's essay. Had I published on the scale in which I began to write in 1856, the book would have been four or five times as large as the origin, and very few would have had the patience to read it. I gained much by my delay in publishing from about 1839, when the theory was clearly conceived, to 1859, and I lost nothing by it, for I cared very little whether men attributed most originality to me or Wallace, and his essay no doubt aided in the reception of the theory. I was forestalled in only one important point, which my vanity has always made me regret, namely, the explanation by means of the glacial period of the presence of the same species of plants and of some few animals on distant mountain summits and in the Arctic regions. This view pleased me so much that I wrote about it in extenso, and I believe that it was read by Hooker some years before E. Forbes published his celebrated memoir, Geological Survey Memoirs, 1846, on the subject. In the very few points in which we differed, I still think I was in the right. I have never, of course, alluded in print to my having independently worked out this view. Hardly any point gave me so much satisfaction when I was at work on the origin as the explanation of the wide difference in many classes between the embryo and the adult animal, and of the close resemblance of the embryos within the same class. No notice of this point was taken, as far as I remember, in the early reviews of the origin, and I recollect expressing my surprise on this head in a letter to Asa Gray. Within late years, several reviewers have given the whole credit to Fritz Müller and Hackel, who undoubtedly have worked it out much more fully, and in some respects more correctly than I did. I had materials for a whole chapter on the subject, and I ought to have made the discussion longer, for it is clear that I failed to impress my readers and he who succeeds in doing so deserves, in my opinion, all the credit. This leads me to remark that I have almost always been treated honestly by my reviewers, passing over those without scientific knowledge as not worthy of notice. 
my views have often been grossly misrepresented, bitterly opposed and ridiculed, but this has been generally done, as I believe, in good faith. On the whole, I do not doubt that my works have been over and over again greatly overpraised. I rejoice that I have avoided controversies, and this I owe to Lyell, who many years ago, in reference to my geological works, strongly advised me never to get entangled in a controversy, as it rarely did any good and caused a miserable loss of time and temper. Whenever I have found out that I have blundered, or that my work has been imperfect, and when I have been contemptuously criticized, and even when I have been overpraised, so that I have felt mortified, it has been my greatest comfort to say hundreds of times to myself that I have worked as hard and as well as I could, and no man can do more than this. I remember when in good success bay, in Tierra del Fuego, thinking, and, I believe, that I wrote home to the effect, that I could not employ my life better than in adding a little to natural science. This I have done to the best of my abilities, and critics may say what they like, but they cannot destroy this conviction. During the two last months of 1859, I was fully occupied in preparing a second edition of The Origin, and by an enormous correspondence, on January 1st, 1860, I began arranging my notes for my work on the variation of animals and plants under domestication, but it was not published until the beginning of 1868, the delay having been caused partly by frequent illnesses, one of which lasted seven months, and partly by being tempted to publish on other subjects, which at the time interested me more. On May 15, 1862, my little book on the fertilization of orchids, which cost me ten months' work, was published. Most of the facts had been slowly accumulated during several previous years. During the summer of 1839, and, I believe, during the previous summer, I was led to attend to the cross-fertilization of flowers by the aid of insects, from having come to the conclusion in my speculations on the origin of species, that crossing played an important part in keeping specific forms constant. I attended to the subject more or less during every subsequent summer, and my interest in it was greatly enhanced by having procured and read in November 1841, through the advice of Robert Brown, a copy of C. K. Sprengel's wonderful book, Das Indecte Geheimnis der Nature. For some years before 1862, I had specially attended to the fertilization of our British orchids, and it seemed to me the best plan to prepare as complete a treatise on this group of plants as well as I could, rather than to utilize the great mass of matter which I had slowly collected with respect to other plants. My resolve proved a wise one, for since the appearance of my book, a surprising number of papers and separate works on the fertilization of all kinds of flowers have appeared, and these are far better done than I could possibly have effected. The merits of poor old Springle, so long overlooked, are now fully recognized many years after his death. During the same year I published in the Journal of the Linnaean Society a paper on the two forms or dimorphic condition of primula, and during the next five years, five other papers on dimorphic and trimorphic plants. I do not think anything in my scientific life has given me so much satisfaction as making out the meaning of the structure of these plants. I had noticed in 1838 or 1839 the dimorphism of linum flavum, and had at first thought that it was merely a case of unmeaning variability. But on examining the common species of primula, I found that the two forms were much too regular and constant to be thus viewed. I therefore became almost convinced 
that the common cowslip and primrose were on the high road to become dioecious, that the short pistil in the one form and the short stamens in the other form were tending towards abortion. The plants were therefore subjected under this point of view to trial, but as soon as the flowers with short pistils fertilized with pollen from the short stamens were found to yield more seeds than any other of the four possible unions, the abortion theory was knocked on the head. After some additional experiment, it became evident that the two forms, though both were perfect hermaphrodites, bore almost the same relation to one another as do the two sexes of an ordinary animal. With Lythrum we have the still more wonderful case of three forms standing in a similar relation to one another. I afterwards found that the offspring from the union of two plants belonging to the same forms presented a close and curious analogy with hybrids from the union of two distinct species. In the autumn of 1864, I finished a long paper on climbing plants and sent it to the Linnaean Society. The writing of this paper cost me four months, but I was so unwell when I received the proof sheets that I was forced to leave them very badly and often obscurely expressed. The paper was little noticed, but when, in 1875, it was corrected and published as a separate book, it sold well. I was led to make up this subject by reading a short paper by Asa Gray, published in 1858. He sent me seeds, and on raising some plants, I was so much fascinated and perplexed by the revolving movements of the tendrils and stems, which movements are really very simple, though appearing at first sight very complex that I procured various and other kinds of climbing plants, and studied the whole subject. I was all the more attracted to it, from not being at all satisfied with the explanation which Henslow gave us in his lectures about twining plants, namely, that they had a natural tendency to grow up in a spire. This explanation proved quite erroneous. Some of the adaptations displayed by climbing plants are as beautiful as those of orchids for ensuring cross-fertilization. My variation of animals and plants under domestication was begun, as already stated, in the beginning of 1860, but was not published until the beginning of 1868. It was a big book and cost me four years and two months hard labor. It gives all my observations and an immense number of facts collected from various sources about our domestic productions. In the second volume, the causes and laws of variation, inheritance, etc., are discussed as far as our present state of knowledge permits. Toward the end of the work, I give my well-abused hypothesis of pangenesis. An unverified hypothesis is of little or no value. But if any one should hereafter be led to make observations by which some such hypothesis could be established, I shall have done good service, as an astonishing number of isolated facts can be thus connected together and rendered intelligible. In 1875, a second and largely corrected edition, which cost me a good deal of labor, was brought out. My Descent of Man was published in February 1871. As soon as I had become, in the year 1837 or 1838, convinced that species were mutable productions, I could not avoid the belief that man must come under the same law. Accordingly, I collected notes on the subject for my own satisfaction, and not for a long time with any intention of publishing. Although in the origin of species, the derivation of any particular species is never discussed, yet I thought it best, in order that no honorable man should accuse me of concealing my views, to add that by the work, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. It would have been useless and injurious to the success of the book to have paraded, 
without giving any evidence, my conviction with respect to his origin. But when I found that many naturalists fully accepted the doctrine of the evolution of species, it seemed to me advisable to work up such notes as I possessed, and to publish a special treatise on the origin of man. I was the more glad to do so, as it gave me an opportunity of fully discussing sexual selection, a subject which had always greatly interested me. This subject, and that of the variation of our domestic productions, together with the causes and laws of variation, inheritance, and the intercrossing of plants, are the sole subjects which I have been able to write about in full, so as to use all the materials which I have collected. The Descent of Man took me three years to write, but then, as usual, some of this time was lost by ill health, and some was consumed by preparing new editions and other minor works. A second and largely corrected edition of The Descent appeared in 1874. My book on the expression of the emotions in men and animals was published in the autumn of 1872. I had intended to give only a chapter on the subject in The Descent of Man, but as soon as I began to put my notes together, I saw that it would require a separate treatise. My first child was born on December 27, 1839, and I at once commenced to make notes on the first dawn of the various expressions which he exhibited, for I felt convinced, even at this early period, that the most complex and fine shades of expression must all have a gradual and natural origin. During the summer of the following year, 1840, I read Sir C. Bell's admiral work on expression, and this greatly increased the interest which I felt in the subject, though I could not at all agree with his belief that various muscles had been specially created for the sake of expression. From this time forward, I occasionally attended to the subject, both with respect to man and our domesticated animals. My book sold largely, 5,267 copies having been disposed of on the day of publication. In the summer of 1860, I was idling and resting near Hartford, where two species of Drosera abound and I noticed that numerous insects had been entrapped by the leaves. I carried home some plants, and on giving them insects, saw the movements of the tentacles, and this made me think it probable that the insects were caught for some special purpose. Fortunately, a crucial test occurred to me, that of placing a large number of leaves in various nitrogenous and non-nitrogenous fluids of equal density and as soon as I found that the former alone excited energetic movements, it was obvious that here was a fine new field for investigation. During subsequent years, whenever I had leisure, I pursued my experiments, and my book on insectivorous plants was published in July 1875, that is, sixteen years after my first observations. The delay in this case as with all my other books, has been a great advantage to me. For a man after a long interval can criticize his own work almost as well as if it were that of another person. The fact that a plant should secrete, when properly excited, a fluid containing an acid, and ferment closely analogous to the digestive fluid of an animal, was certainly a remarkable discovery. During this autumn of 1876, I shall publish on the effects of cross and self-fertilization in the vegetable kingdom. This book will form a complement to that on the fertilization of orchids, in which I showed how perfect were the means for cross-fertilization, and here I shall show how important are the results. I was led to make, during eleven years, the numerous experiments recorded in this volume, by a mere accidental observation, and indeed it required the accident to be repeated before my attention was thoroughly aroused to the remarkable fact that seedlings of self-fertilized parentage are inferior, even in the first generation, 
in height and vigor to seedlings of cross-fertilized parentage. I hope also to republish a revised edition of my book on orchids, and hereafter my papers on dimorphic and trimorphic plants, together with some additional observations on allied points, which I never have had time to arrange. My strength will then probably be exhausted, and I shall be ready to exclaim, Nunc dimittis. End of section 5 Section 6 Written May 1st, 1881 The Effects of Cross and Self-Fertilization was published in the autumn of 1876, and the results there arrived at explain, as I believe, the endless and wonderful contrivances for the transportal of pollen from one plant to another of the same species. I now believe, however, chiefly from the observations of Hermann Müller, that I ought to have insisted more strongly than I did on the many adaptations for self-fertilization, though I was well aware of many such adaptations. A much enlarged edition of my Fertilization of Orchids was published in 1877. In the same year, the different forms of flowers, etc., appeared, and in 1880 a second edition. This book consists chiefly of the several papers on heterostyled flowers originally published by the Linnaean Society, corrected, with much new matter added, together with observations on some other cases, in which the same plant bears two kinds of flowers. As before remarked, no little discovery of mine ever gave me so much pleasure as the making out of the meaning of heterostyled flowers. The results of crossing such flowers in an illegitimate manner I believe to be very important, as bearing on the sterility of hybrids, although these results had been noticed by only a few persons. In 1879, I had a translation of Dr. Ernst Krause's Life of Erasmus Darwin published, and I added a sketch of his character and habits from material in my possession. Many persons have been much interested by this little life, and I am surprised that only 800 or 900 copies were sold. In 1880 I published, with my son Frank's assistance, Our Power of Movement in Plants. This was a tough piece of work. The book bears somewhat the same relation to my little book on climbing plants, which cross-fertilization did to the fertilization of orchids, for in accordance with the principle of evolution, it was impossible to account for climbing plants having been developed in so many widely different groups, unless all kinds of plants possess some slight power of movement of an analogous kind. This I proved to be the case, and I was further led to a rather wide generalization, visibly, that the great and important classes of movements excited by light, the attraction of gravity, etc., are all modified forms of the fundamental movement of circumnutation. It has always pleased me to exalt plants in the scale of organized beings, and I therefore felt an especial pleasure in showing how many and what admirably well-adapted movements the tip of a root possesses. I have now, May 1st, 1881, sent to the printers the manuscript of a little book on the formation of vegetable mold through the action of worms. This is a subject of but small importance, and I know not whether it will interest my readers. Between November 1881 and February 1884, 8,500 copies have been sold. But it has interested me. It is a completion of a short paper read before the Geological Society more than 40 years ago, and has revived old geological thoughts. I have now mentioned all the books which I have published, and these have been the milestones in my life, so that little remains to be said. I am not conscious of any change in my mind during the last thirty years, 
excepting in one point presently, to be mentioned. Nor, indeed, could any change have been expected, unless one of general deterioration. But my father lived to his eighty-third year with his mind as lively as it ever was, and all his faculties undimmed, and I hope that I may die before my mind fails to a sensible extent. I think that I have become a little more skillful in guessing right explanations and in devising experimental tests, but this may probably be the result of mere practice, and of a larger store of knowledge. I have as much difficulty as ever in expressing myself clearly and concisely, and this difficulty has caused me a very great loss of time, but it has had the compensating advantage of forcing me to think long and intently about every sentence, and thus I have been led to see errors in reasoning and in my own observations or those of others. There seems to be a sort of fatality in my mind leading me to put at first my statement or proposition in a wrong or awkward form. Formerly I used to think about my sentences before writing them down, but for several years I have found that it saves time to scribble in a vile hand whole pages as quickly as I possibly can, contracting half the words, and then correct deliberately. Sentences thus scribbled down are often better ones than I could have written deliberately. Having said thus much about my manner of writing, I will add that, with my large books, I spend a good deal of time over the general arrangement of the matter. I first make the rudest outline in two or three pages, and then a larger one in several pages. A few words or one word standing for a whole discussion or series of facts. Each one of these headings is again enlarged, and often transferred before I begin to write it in extenso. As in several of my books, facts observed by others have been very extensively used, and as I have always had several quite distinct subjects in hand at the same time, I may mention that I keep from thirty to forty large portfolios in cabinets with labeled shelves, into which I can at once put a detached reference or memorandum. I have bought many books, and at their ends I make an index of all the facts that concern my work, or, if the book is not my own, write out a separate abstract, and of such abstracts I have a large drawer full. Before beginning on any subject, I look to all the short indexes, and make a general and classified index, and by taking the one or more proper portfolios, I have all the information collected during my life ready to use. I have said that in one respect my mind has changed during the last twenty or thirty years. Up to the age of thirty, or beyond it, poetry of many kinds, such as the works of Milton, Gray, Byron, Wordsworth, Coleridge, and Shelley, gave me great pleasure. And even as a schoolboy I took intense delight in Shakespeare, especially in the historical plays. I have also said that formerly pictures gave me considerable, and music very great delight. But now for many years I cannot endure to read a line of poetry. I have tried lately to read Shakespeare, and found it so intolerably dull that it nauseated me. I have also almost lost my taste for pictures or music. Music generally sets me thinking too energetically, on what I have been at work on, instead of giving me pleasure. I retain some taste for fine scenery, but it does not cause me the exquisite delight which it formerly did. On the other hand, novels which are works of the imagination, though not of a very high order, have been for years a wonderful relief and pleasure to me, and I often bless all novelists. A surprising number have been read aloud to me, and I like all, if moderately good, and if they do not end unhappily, against which a law ought to be passed. A novel, according to my taste, does not come into the first class unless it contains some person whom one can thoroughly love, and if a pretty woman, all the better. This curious and lamentable loss of the higher aesthetic tastes 
is all the odder, as books on history, biographies, and travels, independently of any scientific facts which they may contain, and essays on all sorts of subjects interest me as much as ever they did. My mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding general laws out of large collections of facts, but why this should have caused the atrophy of that part of the brain alone, on which the higher tastes depend, I cannot conceive. A man with a mind more highly organized, or better constituted than mine, would not, I suppose, have thus suffered. And if I had to live my life again, I would have made a rule to read some poetry, and listen to some music at least once every week for perhaps the parts of my brain now atrophied would thus have been kept active through use. The loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness, and may possibly be injurious to the intellect, and more probably to the moral character, by enfeebling the emotional part of our nature. My books have sold largely in England, and have been translated into many languages, and passed through several editions in foreign countries. I have heard it said that the success of a work abroad is the best test of its enduring value. I doubt whether this is at all trustworthy, but judged by this standard my name ought to last for a few years. Therefore it may be worth while to try to analyze the mental qualities and the conditions on which my success has depended, though I am aware that no man can do this correctly. I have no great quickness of apprehension or wit, which is so remarkable in some clever men, for instance, Huxley. I am therefore a poor critic. A paper or a book, when first read, generally excites my admiration, and it is only after considerable reflection that I perceive the weak points. My power to follow a long and purely abstract train of thought is very limited, and therefore I could never have succeeded with metaphysics or mathematics. My memory is extensive, yet hazy. It suffices to make me cautious by vaguely telling me that I have observed or read something opposed to the conclusion which I am drawing, or, on the other hand, in favor of it, and after a time I can generally recollect where to search for my authority. So poor, in one sense, is my memory, that I have never been able to remember for more than a few days a single date or a line of poetry. Some of my critics have said, Oh, he is a good observer, but he has no power of reasoning. I do not think that this can be true, for the origin of species is one long argument from the beginning to the end, and it has convinced not a few able men. No one could have written it without having some power of reasoning. I have a fair share of invention, and of common sense or judgment, such as every fairly successful lawyer or doctor must have, but not, I believe, in any higher degree. On the favorable side of the balance, I think that I am superior to the common run of men in noticing things which easily escape attention, and in observing them carefully. My industry has been nearly as great as it could have been in the observation and collection of facts. What is far more important, my love of natural science, has been steady and ardent. This pure love has, however, been much aided by the ambition to be esteemed by my fellow naturalists. From my early youth I have had the strongest desire to understand or explain whatever I observed, that is, to group all facts under some general laws. These causes combined have given me the patience to reflect or ponder for any number of years over an unexplained problem. As far as I can judge, I am not apt to follow blindly the lead of other men. I have steadily endeavored to keep my mind free so as to give up any hypothesis, however much beloved and I cannot resist forming one on every subject, as soon as facts are shown to be opposed to it. Indeed, 
I have had no choice but to act in this manner, for with the exception of the coral reefs, I cannot remember a single first formed hypothesis which had not after time to be given up or greatly modified. This has naturally led me to distrust greatly deductive reasoning in the mixed sciences. On the other hand, I am not very skeptical. A frame of mind which I believe to be injurious to the progress of science. A good deal of skepticism in a scientific man is advisable to avoid much loss of time, but I have met with not a few men who, I feel sure, have often thus been deterred from experiment or observations, which would have proved directly or indirectly serviceable. In illustration, I will give the oddest case which I have known. A gentleman, who, as I afterwards heard, is a good local botanist, wrote to me from the eastern countries that the seed or beans of the common field bean had this year everywhere grown on the wrong side of the pod. I wrote back, asking for further information, as I did not understand what was meant, but I did not receive any answer for a very long time. I then saw in two newspapers, one published in Kent and the other in Yorkshire, paragraphs stating that it was a most remarkable fact that the beans this year had all grown on the wrong side so I thought there might be some foundation for so general a statement. Accordingly, I went to my gardener, an old Kentish man, and asked him whether he had heard anything about it, and he answered, Oh, no, sir, it must be a mistake, for the beans grow on the wrong side only on leap year, and this is not a leap year. I then asked him how they grew in common years, and how on leap years, but soon found that he knew absolutely nothing of how they grew at any time, but he stuck to his belief. After a time I heard from my first informant, who, with many apologies, said that he should not have written to me had he not heard the statement from several intelligent farmers, but that he had since spoken again to every one of them, and not one knew in the least what he had himself meant so that here a belief, if indeed a statement with no definite idea attached to it can be called a belief, had spread over almost the whole of England without any vestige of evidence. I have known in the course of my life only three intentionally falsified statements, and one of these may have been a hoax, and there have been several scientific hoaxes, which, however, took in an American agricultural journal. It related to the formation in Holland of a new breed of oxen by the crossing of distinct species of bows, some of which I happen to know are sterile together, and the author had the impudence to state that he had corresponded with me and that I had been deeply impressed with the importance of his result. The article was sent to me by the editor of an English agricultural journal, asking for my opinion before republishing it. A second case was an account of several varieties, raised by the author from several species of primula, which had spontaneously yielded a full complement of seed, although the parent plants had been carefully protected from the access of insects. This account was published before I had discovered the meaning of heterostylism, and the whole statement must have been fraudulent, or there was neglect in excluding insects, so gross as to be scarcely credible. The third case was more curious. Mr. Hooth published in his book on consanguineous marriage some long extracts from a Belgian author, who stated that he had interbred rabbits in the closest manner for very many generations, without the least injurious effects. The account was published in a most respectable journal, that of the Royal Society of Belgium, but I could not avoid feeling doubts. I hardly know why, except that there were no accidents of any kind, and my experience in breeding animals made me think this very improbable. 
so with much hesitation I wrote to Professor von Beneden, asking him whether the author was a trustworthy man. I soon heard an answer that the society had been greatly shocked by discovering that the whole account was a fraud. The falseness of the published statements on which Mr. Huth relied has been pointed out by himself in a slip inserted in all the copies of his book which then remained unsold. The writer had been publicly challenged in the journal to say where he had resided and kept his large stock of rabbits while carrying on his experiments, which must have consumed several years, and no answer could be extracted from him. My habits are methodical, and this has been of not a little use for my particular line of work. My habits are methodical, and this has been of not a little use for my particular line of work. Lastly, I have had ample leisure from not having to earn my own bread. Even ill health, though it has annihilated several years of my life, has saved me from the distractions of society and amusement. Therefore, my success as a man of science, whether this may have amounted to, has been determined, as far as I can judge, by complex and diversified mental qualities and conditions. Of these, the most important have been the love of science, unbounded patience in long reflecting over any subject, industry in observing and collecting facts, and a fair share of invention, as well as of common sense. With such moderate abilities as I possess, it is truly surprising that I should have influenced to a considerable extent the belief of scientific men on some important points. End of section 6 End of The Autobiography of Charles Darwin